44. And it says, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him and let him go. Would y'all pray with me? Dear Lord, we just want to ask that you would just fill us with your spirit this morning, that we may be able to understand your word, your plan for everlasting life. And we ask, Lord, that this command that you gave to Lazarus would be given to us, that we can be loosed from all the things that are holding us back from serving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So God is Lord in this thought. Help us, Lord, to present your scriptures and to be filled with your spirit and led by that same spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I'm not going to read the whole story of, of Lazarus here in chapter 11, but I do want to tell the story to give you a context of what it is that we, that we are seeing here. You see, Jesus has been, has been preaching um, all over the place, but, uh, you know, where, where Lazarus is, and he's at a really good place, he lives at Bethany. So, uh, isn't that a good place to be this morning? At Bethany. Well, Lazarus is at Bethany, and he's really sick. And a message comes to him from his, from his sisters to Jesus, saying, Lazarus is really sick. He's close to death. He needs your help. Would you come and heal Lazarus? And Jesus delays. And he keeps teaching his disciples. And then about four days later, he tells his disciples, he's like, I must go and wake Lazarus up. Now, they remember that he's sick. But, the, but they don't understand what Jesus is talking about. And they're like, well, if he's sleeping, that's good, right? He's getting his rest. His body's healing. Jesus says, no, our friend Lazarus is dead. His, his soul has departed, and I'm going back. Now, the disciples, they remember that the last time that they were there, that there was people who wanted to kill him. And Thomas is like, well, let's just go, and we'll just all die together. Thomas didn't have a problem with dying. In fact, most people, I don't know if they, if, they, if they really have as big a problem with dying as they do living. Living is our problem. Death is something that's going to come natural for you. It's living for the right reasons that's so difficult. And what you live for is going to dictate your eternal destination. Like I said, death is not your problem. It's coming your way. It's living that's an issue. And Jesus, he goes and he, he, he want, takes his trip up there. And as soon as he gets there, he's met by Martha. And Martha, she, she goes out to meet him. He's like, Lord, if you had just been here, my, our brother would not have died. Can you, can you picture the pain in her voice knowing that the hands of healing were nearby? But they just weren't there to do what they needed to do. And she's like, if you had been here, he would still be alive. And Jesus had explained to his disciples already that the death is for God's glory. Can you imagine that? That is not the way that we picture death. We think death is like this, this thing that's horrible, that there's total loss. But in Lazarus' case, it was, for, it was to glorify God. Hey, and you know what? That's the way that your death should be too. Your death should glorify God. Not because of the death part of it, but because we know where you're going. And that even at your departure of your soul, we can say God is good and that you are in a better place. And be able to say that with all the integrity within our hearts. It is really good to know that person is in heaven. But if you've not lived for Jesus, how are we going to know that you're with Jesus? You know, that's a lot of people, they think, well, I got this golden ticket or God doesn't, you know, God, if God is good, he won't send anybody to hell. Listen, God doesn't send anybody to hell. You 
do that. You decide that. God just looks at the evidence, right? He looks at the evidence. And he says, well, what did you decide? Did you decide on eternal life or eternal death? And he just opens up what you decided and then rewards you according to what you did with Jesus Christ. Do y'all agree with that? God rewards you according to your deed. Well, it's that deed. Did you believe in Jesus? And Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believes in me, they'll live. Martha, do you believe this? And she believes, but she doesn't understand how to believe right. You know, there's a bunch of people out there. They don't understand how to believe right. Yeah, they believe in Jesus, but the demons, the scripture tells us, believe and tremble also. You need to believe correctly. Well, how do you believe correctly? He tells Martha, you've got to believe that I am who I said I am and that I'll do what I said I will do. Well, let me tell you who Jesus is real quick before we finish any more of this story. Jesus is God come in the flesh to die for your sins. And that's exactly what he did. He died for your sins and you must believe that he is God in the flesh and that he did die for your sins, but not that he stayed dead, but it, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he's coming back and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's who Jesus is. Do you believe correctly? Amen. Is he Lord of lords in your life? Is he the king of kings in your life? Well, most people, they would say, well, I'm the king of my life. I'm the Lord of my life. How do we know if you are? Well, you do whatever you want to do, and you don't do what God wants you to do. That's how you know who the right Lord, who's Lord in your life. If you, God is Lord, then you do what he wants you to do. Is that simple? It is that simple. Do you know Jesus, do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life, Martha? Well, I believe he's going to be resurrected in the last day. Jesus says, no, today is the resurrection. Today is life. Let me make that which is dead alive. Martha doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. She's like, yea, Lord. And then she goes and gets Mary. And Mary is mourning. And she too, she's like, Jesus, if you'd just been here. She comes to Jesus and she just falls down at his feet and says, Lord, if you, Jesus, if you'd just been here. You cast demons out of me. Surely this would not have been hard for you. And it isn't hard for Jesus. And Jesus knows what he's about to do. And the scripture says that he weeps. And I don't think he's weeping about the situation, about Lazarus dying. People looking around, they see that. They say, well, he must have really loved Lazarus. They're assuming. I know what happens next. Jesus is going to raise Lazarus up. And there's going to be a desire to kill him again. And that breaks the heart of God. And Jesus weeps, knowing that there are so many, even after he's been dead for four days, people still will not believe that Jesus has the power to save. They still won't believe, and they will seek his life, because they don't want God fixing people's lives. They don't. They don't want to see God fixing someone else's life. They don't want to see God fixing your life either. They would much sooner see you failing than see you living for God. That's the way this world works. That's the way it worked in Jesus' day. That's the way it works today. They want This world wants you to fail, but God wants you to succeed. And he says, take me to the tomb where Lazarus is. And they tell go to the tomb. I can just imagine people think that he just wants to mourn at the tomb because that's what people do. That's what we do. 
We mourn at the funeral, but not Jesus. He gets there and he says, remove the stone. It's in the way. I need to talk to Lazarus. But that stone's got to be moved out of the way. And Martha's like, Lord, it's been four days. He's not smelling good right now. And Jesus looks at Martha and says, Martha, didn't I tell you that I am the resurrection and I come with life? I thought you believed. So they roll away the stone. And God does this. He calls the name. Lazarus, come forth. I've always heard the, some preachers preach. They're like, the reason he called Lazarus' name, because if he, if he just made it general, everybody would have came out of there. Jesus just wanted Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what Lazarus does? Even the dead body obeys the command of its creator. And the soul of Lazarus returned to his body. Now, Lazarus, he's not just freely laid. He's bound up. Can you imagine his mummified self trying to get to it? And all the commotion around and the gasp of air, like, what is going on? And Lazarus stands there. And people just stare. And Jesus says, well, loose him. Let him go. Let the things that's keeping him in, in bondage, let him be released. Let him be made free. And they loosed Lazarus. Man, isn't that a good word? And Jesus looks to you. And he wants the same thing for you. He wants you to be loosed. And God says, let my person go. You know, Lazarus, had, this story is quite the parallel to the problem that we have in sin. As we all have a sickness. It is sin. And it has killed our spirit. That's what happened when Adam and Eve ate the fruit. It killed their spirit. And sin is killing our debt, our bodies too. Because every one of us, we are point, it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. But look what it says in verse 4 of chapter 11 here. It says, and when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. God wants to glorify you, glorify God, even through your sickness and your problems. He can use what, what the world looks at and says, well, they're a miserable failure. God can use it. That which the devil wants to use for evil, God can mean it for good. And he, and he looks at you and he says, yeah, you've got all this mess in your life, but I can still use you. You're not too far gone. God cares about you. He wants you to do something great for his glory. Amen. He wants to use you. Don't think I'm too far gone. I'm, too, I'm so messed up. God can't use this. God used Lazarus and he was a dead man. If God can use a dead body, surely if there's any life in you, he can use you too. Right? Jesus, look at verse 7. It says, then after that, he saith unto his disciples, let us go unto Jerusalem. You see, Jesus goes to those that want his cure. You know, if you're sitting back there and you're like, you know, that's a fine message, preacher. But I just, it's not for me. Well, that's fine. You have every right to believe that. God wants to help those who want his help. He's a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. And if your decision is without God, don't be surprised when you enter into, into eternity that you continue to be without God in your life. That is the logical conclusion of the matter. But God says to those who seek his face, who want him around, he will be there with them. In fact, he'll be a friend closer than a brother. 
That's what the scripture tells us. But this world does not truly understand your situation. It's never going to understand your situation. The world tries to give you all other types of things that it thinks will help you. But only Jesus knows that your spirit is dead and must be made alive. Look at what verse 14 and 15 says. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that ye might believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. You see the disciples, they are struggling with their belief. They're around Jesus all the time. They're still struggling with their belief. If you struggle with belief, that is not a sin. It's your failure to try to understand. Your failure to be teachable. Your failure to say, God, I have messed up. I need help. That's not a sin. That leads you to the cure. And Jesus is the only cure, and he understands your situation. If you want to look in Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read a couple verses to you. And it says, and you hath he quickened. That means to make alive. What were you dead? You were dead in trespasses and sins. In verse 5 of Ephesians 2, it says this. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Because you're not saved by a work that, you're do, that you do. You're saved by grace through faith. That's why Jesus tells Martha, believe that I am the resurrection and the life. Look at verse 25. That's what Jesus says. And he said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, Yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And, Mary's, and Martha's like, I do believe. But she doesn't. She doesn't really understand it. And Jesus is using Lazarus to help her understand the, what the resurrection really is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 will say it very similar to this, in ver, starting at verse 54. It says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immorality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the world looks at death as the most horrible thing. But God sees it as an opportunity to fix something that is broken. You see, this body is broken. And Lazarus is just a picture of what's to come. God can raise a dead body. It doesn't matter if it's one day old, four days old, or hundreds or thousands of years old. He can raise the body. And he says this to you, that believe on him. I will give you a new body. Right now, what you're living in is corrupt. God's got to fix it. And he can fix it. But what the scripture tells us, that he's going to do that in the last day. He's going to fix everybody. Because if you, I mean, who wants the current body that you have to be fixed? Anybody having some pains lately? We don't have prayer requests for no reason, right? Right? We have pains. We have hurts. And it even goes into our emotion. God has a fix. And it is the resurrection. And God said, I want to show you something, guys. I'm not limited in time. Even though the body is already decaying, I can fix that. And I have a plan. I am going to fix that in the res resurrection. And that's what Martha, she's thinking that. She's like, oh, yeah, you're going to fix him later. She's, G Jesus tells her, I want people to believe, Martha, I can resurrect a body anytime I get ready to. And that's when he said, that's when he says, death is swallowed up in victory. You do not need to be afraid of death if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Because he has the cure. Now what about the life? 
Psalms 36, verse 9, it says, For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy life we shall see light. You see, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when you all, probably what you see in this world is all bad. That's why our news agencies, they only, they only give you bad news. You ever thought about that? Like, why can't they give good news? Isn't there some good news out there? Well, bad news sells better. And they're like, well, the world looks for bad news. We'll just give them a bunch of bad news. But those who are looking at the light, they're looking for some good news. And I have some good news for you today. Jesus saves. And he wants to save you. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He could take that which is dead in its trespasses and sins and make it. Have you been made alive? You know, that was kind of mine and Emma's discussion. Has she been born again? Does she know Jesus as her life? But there are some things going on, just like in Lazarus, even in the, his death, there's some things that are problematic. There's a stone. And I looked at this stone and I'm like, when people come to know the Lord, it seems like there's always Things that are in the way. All kinds of things. Sometimes it's ball games. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's friends. Sometimes it's just your activities that you want to do. You don't want to give up your time. There's something in your way that's going to prevent you from being able to come to Jesus. In Lazarus' case, it's a big rock. Over his, over his grave. And Jesus says, that rock needs to be removed. We've got to remove those things that are in our way. Isaiah 52, 59 and verse 2 would explain it. That those things are iniquities. They're sin. Have you admitted lately that you have sin in your life? You know, that's when I ask Emma... I'm like, why do you want to be saved? And she's like, well, I've just been praying every night for a, for a week, maybe longer, that God would take away my sins. And then she started telling me, I'm not going to tell you what, what all she said. But she recognizes that there are some things in her life that are iniquities. We need to recognize those iniquities in our life and say, I want those removed. That's what Emma said, too. You see, her heart is leaning in that right direction. Everyone's heart needs to... You never need to leave that situation. You always should want those iniquities removed from your life. They are between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you. That he will not hear. If you're holding on to your sins, you have made them the God of your life. And God says, repent. Repent. Repent of those things and be born again. <clears throat> Look what he says to once they remove the stone, which those things are out of the way. Then he, Lazarus can hear the voice of the Savior in verse 43. Come. Come. You know that expression God is still offering to you and to me. You see it even in the book of Revelation. Come. In Isaiah 1 and verse 18, he says it there. Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be made white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they can be made as wool. Come, Jesus says to Lazarus, let me fix you. And Jesus looks at you and he says your name too. Elmo, come. Sister Carolyn, come. Isaac, come. Sean, come. He looks at you specifically. He knows your name. And he extends his hand. Come. Let me take that which was dead and bound in the trespasses of sins and let me resurrect it to new life. In verse 44, we see that final command. Loose him and let him go. You see, you don't have to be bound 
by all the things in this world. You don't have, you see, we, it's like, we're like Lazarus. We get so wrapped up in all the nonsense of this world. And to be honest, the nonsense of this world do not even matter. When you're gone, nobody's going to remember all the problems that you had. Even our current president, he's got some good problems, right? When he's dead and gone, nobody is going to remember all his problems. Don't just blame the next president, right? That won't matter. Why do you get so wrapped up in all these things and they keep you from being made free? And Jesus commanded you, be loosed. Make him free. And you know, that's exactly what Jesus wants in your life. He wants you to be loosed. Let him go. I want to read to you some final scriptures in Romans chapter 6. In verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You see, that's how you know that you've been loosed from your sins. You want to be servants of righteousness. There's a change that happens in your life. You're not letting this world bog you down anymore. You know, and I hope Emma's holding on to this. Righteousness is now her goal. Is she, that, does that mean that she's going to be perfect? She's not going to be made perfect. But she wants to be. She wants to be righteous. She wants to be holy. And that's what we see in the scripture. I speak after the manner of men in verse 19 in Romans chapter 6. Cause, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to, and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members to righteousness and holiness. You see, that's the change that happens when you're loosed. You see, when you're bound by sin and all the things of this world, you're good at being bad. Anybody in here, you've been good at being bad before? If you don't believe it, you ought to come to my house. They're all good at being bad. But when you're loosed, it's amazing that in, in my house, they're good at being bad. But when they get around other people, they're good at being good. I wonder how that works. Well, I know how it works. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we see in Romans chapter 6, it seems like. Is that I want to show my heart of holiness and righteousness. Because that, there's been that change made. The change that happens in my mind first. I want my sins forgiven. In my heart, I feel like I want my sins forgiven. In my life, it looks like my sins forgiven. And I want to live with Je for Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why? Because he is the resurrection and the life. And I want to resemble the resurrection of and the life, because that's why how you, that's how he's created me. He's changed in me and given me a new heart, a new mind, and a new life. That's why the scripture says in John 3 16, thou must be born again. You must be born again. And you know, today, Emma's gonna come up here in a minute. And she's not getting born again today. She's just going to show you that she believes in Jesus with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength. That with the baptism, it doesn't save a person. It shows them what Jesus did for them. How that he died. And that he rose again on the third day. He died. He was buried that's why, that's why we go all the way under the water. You know, if you really wanted to represent it right, you would use dirt. Because that's what really happens right when you bury somebody. But it's a, it's a little bit harder to dig somebody, bring somebody out of the dirt than it is the water. So we use water. 
So we put them all the way under it like they're buried. And then they're brought up. And that's what the scripture tells us. Buried in his likeness and raised to walk according to your flesh? No. The newness of life that the resurrection will show forth in that person who says, I agree with Jesus. Let me ask you something. Do you agree with Jesus? Maybe more than one of you needs to be baptized this morning. The water is ready. But even more important, have you been born again? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Brother Sean and Isaac, would you come? Would the rest of you stand with me? Let's pray. Dear Lord, that you will guide us in the understanding. We see Lazarus' life, that it was a picture of what you do in each and every person who has been made loose from all the bondage of trespasses and sins. We see, Lord, that we have a problem. we got sin, and we need a cure. And we know, Lord, that this world does not understand how to cure us. There's not enough, there's not enough experience in the medical community to heal me of what is causing me to die in this world. But I know, Lord, that you've got to fix. I just got to get these things out of my way. So that I can hear your voice. And when I hear that voice calling that says, come, Lord, may I come to you and let you make, take the bondage away from me. So that I can no longer live being wrapped up in all the things of this world. But I can be loosed. Not because I'm so good, but because you're so good. Guide us, Lord, that we may be able to understand your gospel, that you came to save sinners just like me, just like Emma. Lord, that everyone here may know you and your power, your love, and your mercy. Let us to walk by faith and not by sight and accept your Savior as our personal Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would stand with us, turn number 611.